Welcome everyone. While while uh, while people are joining, I'll just start a little bit of an introduction. I'm excited to welcome you all to our third of three webinars about new healthcare challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath, sponsored by UCSF and the San Francisco Bay Collaborative Research Network. Our Previous two webinars, one on primary care workforce issues and the other on long COVID can be viewed on our SF Bay CRN website. This webinar series will be followed by uh, another meeting on September 23rd, which will be our first in-person annual meeting since the start of the pandemic. This will be an exciting opportunity for academic researchers, healthcare leaders, policymakers, and community stakeholders to share their work and to network. So please save the date. My name is Michael Potter. I'm a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the director of the San Francisco Bay Collaborative Research Network, uh, otherwise known as SF Bay CRN. SF Bay CRN is UCSF's primary care uh, practice-based research network supported by the UCSF Clinical and Translational Science Institute. In addition to educational meetings such as this, we also provide consultations to facilitate the development of practice-based research partnerships. Please reach out to us if you're interested in learning more about our network. And now I want to thank you all again for joining us today to hear Santoy Trotter and David Hoskins share their experiences studying and addressing the mental health of children and adolescents in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ms. Trotter is a clinical director of school-based health behavioral health programs at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. And Dr. Hoskins is a bilingual and bicultural pediatric psychologist who provides direct clinical service and conducts research also at Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. Each will present a unique perspective on today's topic. And after we hear their presentations, I will be joined by Dr. Gina Lewis, who directs the Federally Qualified Health Center at Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland, and serves as a board member on our PCORI funded Here With Community Project. The two of us will co-moderate a question and answer period uh, with the speakers. Please post your questions in the chat and we'll make sure your questions get answered. And now finally, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Trotter to get us started. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it and appreciate uh, being here with all of you and looking forward to sharing with you just our experiences in school-based health clinics, uh, working primarily with adolescents ages 11 to 25 uh, during the past 15, 16 years, but also during specifically during these last two years. Um, I do want to share in addition to being a behavioral health clinician, clinical director, I'm also a mom of a middle schooler um, in Oakland Public Schools. So, you know, definitely experienced firsthand, kind of the, like many of you, right, the impact of COVID-19 on the health and wellness of, you know, my own son and, you know, our family, friends, and community. So I want to um, invite each of us to bring in our own experiences as we're also thinking about the uh, experiences of the communities that we serve. So we're also in a week of liberation and celebration. So just want to acknowledge that we're in between Juneteenth and really being able to celebrate that right as a you know federal holiday um, this year um, and really want to speak to the liberation practices um, that are ongoing and that we as health providers, you know, must, you know, may continue to join with. Um, and I appreciate the statement by the um, Association of Black Psychologists that really honors the African Black ancestors elders and previously incarcerated families on, on what is being called Juneteenth, right? And that this struggle for liberation that impacts our health and well-being and the health and well-being of our children continues. Um, I also want to acknowledge here we are uh, on the other side of this weekend, Gay Pride, um, and you know just really to acknowledge that celebration. And, and you know when we think about health outcomes and health impact, um, and particularly on communities that have been historically oppressed and marginalized. Um, so important to also to hold the resiliency practices and the wellness practices. And a lot of those 
things that impact our uh, mental health, our physical health, also um, our acts towards creating, you know, a better uh, world for all of us, where people can stand in the, stand and be celebrated in their dignity. And for all of us during this time, um, just to pause and to acknowledge the uh, fact that we are still in unprecedented times. You know, this was created by, you know, this acknowledgement was created by folks at uh, Trauma Transform, including colleague Jen Leland, um, but to hold that these, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, and we're still in unprecedented times. This has not happened before. Um, we are all holding a multitude of feelings and emotions in every moment, right? Fears, grief and loss, sorrow, joys, discovery, um, and to hold and to acknowledge the complexity of the feelings that we're walking with as human beings right now on this earth. And that we're all, um, that there are many responses to stress and uncertainty, and all of those responses are valid, right? This is a time to practice compassion, compassion and care um, for ourselves, for our patients, for our communities, for our family members, um, to continue to cultivate a sense of compassion and collective care. Right? This is the most important work and the thing to have inquiry around. How do we do that? How do we do that well inside of our healthcare systems? And you know, I'm glad to be a part of this panel to reflect, to think about inquiry and what are we prioritizing? What are some of the most critical needs? So we are here, COVID-19 pandemic right now, you know, two years ago, we probably wouldn't have recognized this image and now it is common. Um, probably a five-year-old could say that's COVID-19. Um, and, you know, I have an eight-year-old friend who spoke about the world that we live in right now. You know, and if you can take a moment and be in an eight-year-old seat or in a 18-year-old seat, um, and the impact of the threat, you know, living with a pervasive threat that might kill you or your family member, right? In particular, if you're thinking about pre-vaccines, um, the fear that many family members and uh, children felt about what was this disease that we don't understand and that could lead to death, right? And on top of that, um, the reckoning of you know, again, right, a collective reckoning of the racialized violence um, and oppression and structural oppression, um, particularly against Black people, but also racialized violence against Asian, Latinx, Black, Indigenous people of color, right, that we are continuing to come again and again with the impact of that collective trauma. Um, and then just recently, all of us holding, right, deep sorrow and care and, um, re-remembering uh, the impact of gun violence with Buffalo the, and also Uvalde, right? So here we are. These are the conditions that our children are growing up and growing into. And as well as climate change. I mean, it was 99 degrees in Oakland two days ago, right? So this is, you know, not only is it, whew, it's hot, but also, again, the world that our children are living in, are growing up in and becoming, into, uh, you know, adult into, really gives this message of the world is not safe. There are colossal threats that not only have our parents not figured out, right, their parents haven't figured out, our government hasn't figured out, um, and this is what our children are inheriting, right, is this legacy. I think for us in the school-based health clinics, working in East and West Oakland and communities, what we saw that there are already many adverse childhood experiences that were impacting young people and we saw it get worse. We saw young people who became the primary breadwinners in their families because they could get that job and maybe they weren't doing remote schooling because they were going and working as a cashier at Safeway. Um, we saw the impact of loss of ritual and traditions. I remember being on a Zoom meeting with a young person, one of our youth advisory board members, um, when prom was canceled. And that might seem like a slight thing, but it is a ritual that that young person, a source of joy, a source of hope, a source of connection that that young person was looking for, had probably already picked out a dress for, and then wasn't able to access. Um, we saw even greater insecurity around housing and homelessness and doubling up. Um, we also saw young people who did not have access to technology. Yes, telehealth um, and, 
building our collective our, our clinicians capacity to be able to provide telehealth services in some ways increase access to our healthcare services but for many young people they did not have access to zoom or to a phone or to some of the to solid internet right some of the things that would support that access and so we know this you know this things got worse um, particularly for poor people um, and marginalized people and families um, we also know that before the pandemic yeah, there was a mental health crisis for young people and for adolescents um, that we were already needing more services and i really want us to hold and that the mental health crisis is not because there's anything wrong with young people or that young people are more vulnerable. Um, it is because of the conditions, right, the circumstances, um, the world that they are, they are, um, that, that they are living in. And so how do we meet them both with resources, but also continue to do some of that collective change and that liberatory liberat liberatory work that is needed in order to create better conditions for young people, for poor people, for their families, or young people, or people impacted by poverty. Let me restate that statement. Um, and even now during this continued pandemic, uh, you know, the CDC uh, has provided information around 37% of young people report, right, and this is self-report, poor mental health during the pandemic. Um, one of the things that we have seen with Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, for many celebrities being able to speak to and name uh, work that we did to really kind of, po how do we popularize, popularize mental health and mental health services? And so just to give a few examples, you know, of some of our curriculum and some of the slides that were developed by our team. And I want to just remind, you know, all of us, right, kind of what are some basic things that support mental health? Like, have you moved, ex you know, exercise means, you know, movement, eating, and sleep, right? That's something that we can all, all apply. Like, if we're not feeling well, have I eaten? Am I sleeping? Am I moving? Right? That's something for everyone to just remind or really have that as, like, quick language that you have. Um, advocacy, system change, engagement, um, whether it's in your school and your hospital in your clinic right? that also supports health and well-being um, rest and boundaries there's more work to do um, but sometimes you got to be at the for forefront of that work and sometimes you got to sit back and rest and then come back in because we need everyone who's still here sometimes you know for the people who are in this room right now sometimes i'm surprised like we're still here somehow we're making it through um, and so we need you we need each other and so please you know having rest restoration boundaries, um, continuing to connect to something greater. We live, for those who are in Oakland or in the Bay, right, the redwoods, the ocean, spirituality, music, po poetry, um, and taking that time to have purposeful pauses. You know, one of our clinicians said, this work is transformational for us and our young people. So holding that and we need to, you know, what are the questions? What are the questions that we will hold in this pandemic, right? And I think a few things that I want to share is light touches were really helpful. So what about texting, mental health on demand, having it not look in a traditional way, having cultural congruent mental health, and schools as a healing space and trauma-informed environment. So I'm going to pause here and I'm really grateful for your time and attention and hopefully let you hear from my amazing colleague, Dr. David Hoskins. Thank you so much, uh, Santoy. That was a wonderful presentation. A lot of a lot of really great um, food for thought, I think. And while David gets up his slides, um, I am going to remind people that you can, as I think someone already has, has put a question in uh, the Q and A, and we'll do the questions at the end. Um, and um, I appreciate. Uh, that we can now go on to the next the next talk and hear what um, David's work has been. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, Santoy. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the unmet needs of, of Latinx youth during the pandemic. Um, give me one second to situate my slides. There we go. Uh, so I'm a pediatric psychologist. I've been with Children's Hospital for about 10 years. Um, I do both clinical and research at the hospital. My clinical work, I, I tend to be known as a, a family therapist and a trauma therapist. 
And then in terms of research, um, I've been researching the, the behavioral health needs of Latinx youth and their families. And then once I start to understand what the behavioral health needs, um, I've been designing some treatment interventions for this same population. So once again, today I'm gonna to be focusing on Latinx youth. I'm a supervisor in what's called the Pediatric Psychology Program at, at uh, Children's Hospital. Um, the pictures on the right are some of our wonderful trainees from our recent cohort. Those are five bilingual and bicultural trainees, uh, and three of them speak Spanish. Um, uh, I've been thinking about some of the projects that uh, we've been introducing into the primary care system. One of the reasons that I think that they've been successful in engaging families is is that I'm uh, based in the clinic. Uh, when, when families come in to see somebody uh, or come in to see the physician, I'm also a part of that team. So the families get to know me pretty well and, and the hospital obviously knows me pretty well too. Uh, the particular program that I'm gonna be talking a little bit about just to give context, um, the pediatric psychology program. So uh, Oakland Unified, when there's a, a individual comes such as a recent immigrant, um, the the, uh, the schools in Oakland, they, they send the families to the children's hospital and they get their first vaccinations with us. So the, the very first time that they meet the physician for their vaccinations, they also meet a, a case manager and then they meet one of the mental health providers at the same time. Uh, we've been uh, training doctoral level students uh, in an integrated healthcare setting for about eight years. And the specific population that we work with is called a transitional homeless population. Uh, what that means is anybody that's been uh, homeless for a long time to, to individuals that are in transitional um, housing or, or recent immigrants. And a lot of the recent immigrants that we see are coming from Latin America. Um, yeah. So, um, I'll provide some background information from the literature and then uh, going to provide some context and, and some clinical examples in a little bit. Um, so at the moment, uh, border crossings um, for individuals from Latin America are at an all-time high. Um, when they come to us, they come to us with uh, multiple and various types of trauma experiences and then mental health needs. Um, one of the things that we were finding um, when the when some of the kids were coming in, they had to get their first initial vaccinations at the hospital. Um, they were starting to show a lot of distress, and so as the mental health providers, we were trying to figure out like um, what might be some of the causes and how might we be able to help this situation in primary care. Um, well, one of the things that we came to find out is. Uh, that these kids also got vaccinations in the detention centers. So it was actually in primary care when they were getting their vaccinations, it was a trauma reminder of when they were in the detention center. And that was causing some pretty significant um, behaviors when some of the kids were getting their vaccinations in primary care. Um, for these, uh, for the more recent immigrants, uh, we, we were finding so much that they had so many trauma experiences, we had to begin to think about the best way to uh, begin to assess these kids and families. Um, we, we brought in a framework to begin to, to understand what these families go through. Um, and the framework actually looks at uh, four different areas. So uh, our assessments look at uh, pre-migration. So uh, this means, what made the family uh, leave the country of origin, whether it's Mexico or Central America. Um, what we came to find out is uh, a lot of families were, were, were witnessing and experiencing torture and abuse, uh, persecution. And then there's a really common experience of family separations from anywhere two to five years. Um, and yeah, so that was one of the first areas that we, we typically assess. One of the second areas is what's called in transit. So we want to understand um, what, if these kids are fleeing from Central America, um, they go through a treacherous journey from Central America, have to cross the Central American border, the Mexican border, and then they come into the U.S. That journey, which is called a, a, a migration narrative, uh, we came to find out it's actually a, a trauma narrative, given so many difficult experiences that they were they were witnessing in transit, uh, things like witnessing witnessing death, experiencing abuse, and again, uh, family separations. The third area of assessment for us tends to be when these kids arrive into the U.S. Um, a lot of them 
are, are coming from the detention centers. So we want to ask about that experience in the detention centers. And again, we're, we're, we find a lot of tra trauma experiences that we need to attend to. Um, there's the family separation, but there's also family reunification that happens in the detention centers. And lastly is uh, post-migration. So uh, once these families are starting to establish here in the US, what are some of the stressors or traumatic experiences that they're experiencing? Uh, so there's, we've been finding that there's discrimination, xenophobia. Uh, there's the family separation post-migration, but something uh, that's also very important is once they're here in the US, a lot of times it's when they reunify. So a parent reunifying with their kid that they haven't seen for five, eight, 10 years in person. Um, and there can, there can be some resent, resentment and emotional distress. Um, and then we also wanna uh, identify healthcare needs. Uh, for the Latinx community, uh, COVID-19 has impacted it disproportionately. Uh, for example, here in California, the Latinx population makes up 39% of individuals here in California, um, but uh, out of individuals that have been, uh, contracted COVID, Latinx individuals uh, represent 46% of those individuals, uh, and, and individuals that have passed away from COVID, um, that the Latinx population uh, has made up 44% of those deaths. Uh, so, and then it's also hit Latinx youth disproportionately. So individuals from zero to 17. Uh, what Latinx youth represent 48% of the population in, here in California, but they were 54% of all cases of individuals that contracted COVID, as well as 54% of the deaths. Um, so this is from the literature, but I'm going to talk about some clinical examples in a little bit. Um, what the literature would suggest that amongst the Latinx population, given that they're disproportionately impacted by COVID, um, they're seeing some increased mental health needs. Um, so obviously the grief and multiple losses related to COVID-19, and then that's imposed upon uh, some of the caregiver youth separation that's already been experienced in the related distress. Uh, there's been some increases in ang anxiety and depression, um, and then substance use initiation uh, since COVID-19 hit, and, and lastly, recent suicidal ideation. Um, before I go into my clinical examples, uh, the last point I want to make is that prior to the pandemic, uh, there is, it's pretty well known that there's a lack of culturally relevant and linguistic services available to, to Spanish speakers. Um, psychologists aren't the only individuals that provide mental health services, uh, but just to give an example, 5% of psychologists here in the United States identify as Latinx and 5.5% of psychologists in the United States speak Spanish. It's a really small uh, number of individuals that can serve the Spanish speaking population. Um, and then once COVID hit, um, as the mental health needs increased, um, something else that we were finding, it was really difficult to find a therapeutic home for some of the families that we were seeing in primary care. Um, I, I wanted to introduce um, a few clinical examples just to contextualize what I'm talking about. Um, so the, the picture on the right, it's um, a lot of the teachers talk about when they're teaching, once the pandemic hit, that when they're teaching over Zoom, they're teaching to blank screens. Uh, sometimes that happens in therapy too. Um, a lot of the kids are talking about the lack of peer interactions and uh, it's impacted some of the uh, interpersonal development that, that's going on with these kids. Uh, for example, Juan, um, he was a 13 year old kid. He was removed by CPS because his parents were using substances and he was placed in the care of his Spanish speaking grandmother. Uh, to begin with, they were, they were seeking mental health services uh, during the pandemic, but they couldn't find anything in Alameda County. So they were referred to another county. Um, they got connected with those mental health services, but it was an hour away for this particular grandma who, who was working multiple jobs. They ultimately disengaged from that provider because it was over an hour drive and she was working multiple jobs. Um, 
we got the referral and luckily because of our training program we were able to take this kid on um, when we did our initial assessment with him uh, he was exhibiting a lot of suicidal ideation and social anxiety um, he didn't feel like prior to the pandemic he was having any social anxiety but he said after a year and a half or two years of not having any peer interactions um, that he was beginning he was beginning to feel really anxious um, at the thought of having going back to school and uh, that was exhibited over over Zoom too. He, at times, he wouldn't turn on his camera to interact during ther during therapy. Uh, so, just to highlight some of the the common things amongst clients, uh, this particular clinical situation it illustrates a lack of service providers, uh, more severe social anxiety that we're seeing in the pandemic, and uh, some of the increases in suicidal ideation as well. Um, this. The second case, um, he was a, his, I'm going to call him Jose. He was a 14 year old boy um, and his parents were monolingual Spanish speaking. Um, what we did in the, in the hospital is we actually started multifamily gr uh, groups um, because we knew it would allow us to be able to reach more individuals with just one to two therapists. Um, so this family actually um, engaged in the multifamily uh, therapy setting as well. So we had multiple families um, going through a manualized treatment, which I'll talk about at the, in the end of this presentation. Um, this kid was actually referred because his grandmother had died from COVID-19. Uh, when we did our assessment with this particular kid, he was having some pretty severe suicidal ideation. Um, he said he couldn't leave his house. He was getting flooded with uh, feeling really angry uh, that his grandmother had passed away as well as scared. He was having ruminating thoughts about um, contracting COVID in himself and dying. Um, using the trauma-informed model that I, that I uh, talked about a little bit, um, it works up to a, what's called a trauma narrative. So the, the family together in English and Spanish work up to a narrative where they talk about the, um, the experience of, of losing the grandmother. Um, as we were going through the trauma narrative, this particular father, he actually started to disclose his increase in alcohol use um, related to the passing of his own mother during COVID-19. And this was actually one of the first times the family was able to process the, the loss of the grandmother to, to COVID-19. Uh, so this clinical situation, it highlights uh, grief and loss that we're seeing related to COVID-19, uh, the multi-generational needs, um, uh, some of the increase in substance use initiation, and then um, our, our need for clini clinicians that speak both English and Spanish. And then this last kid, um, he's what's called an, an accompanied minor that we saw through the hospital. Um, Oscar was a 17-year-old boy that immigrated from Central America. Um, his mom immigrated when he was 10, and then he immigrated when he was 15. So there's a five-year uh, five gap where they were separated. Um, he was actually threatened by the gangs in Central America, and he was told either join the gang or he was going to um, be killed by the gang. So from one day to the next, um, he picked up his sister who had special needs and was quite a bit younger, and they fled from Central America, crossing the Central American border, the Mexican border. Um, and into the U.S. They were actually detained at the U.S. and uh, he was separated from his younger sister with uh, special needs. He said he didn't sleep for a few days because he was so worried about his younger sister and he didn't know what had happened to her. Um, but when he was able, actually able to see her during a lunchroom. He could see her through a window um, and that's when he was able to start sleeping. Uh, when, when he came to us, he was having some pr pretty significant suicidal ideation as well and exhibiting some depression. He actually refused telehealth. Um, so Zoom can be a wonderful way to engage individuals, but for this particular family, they didn't want to engage over telehealth. So we had to be creative around uh, how we met with him. Um, we used uh, some trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy with him and some dyadic interventions. Um, given that he was separated from his mom for five years, um, he did have some resentment and they had some difficulty interacting when, when they got back together. Uh, so this, this situation illustrates the common experience of the caregiver use separation that we see in clinic that's related to immigration and increased trauma and stress. Um, so just to recap some of the things that we're seeing in clinic with this population, 
uh, we're seeing an increase of grief and multiple losses, and that's imposed upon the caregiver use separation and the related distress. Uh, we're seeing uh, some more severe mental health disorders, including suicidal ideation and social anxiety, uh, some increase in substance use initiation, um, the multi-generational needs and the lack of service providers that, that are able to engage these families. Um, some of the interventions that we're using in clinic to address these needs. The first one is a, a model that I actually created prior to the pandemic. Uh, it's called Positive Ad Adaptations for Trauma and Healing, and we've continued to use, utilize it during the pandemic. Um, it's a way to be able to engage more families, and we, um, given given the multi-family um, need or multi-generational needs, we're able to work with the youth and the caregivers, as well as having providers that are bilingual. Um, it's a three-part intervention that integrates resilience theory, a trauma-informed model, as well as positive psychology, um, and it's a manualized treatment that, that lasts about 10 weeks. The, the second intervention that we've been able to integrate, um, it was adapted from uh, Dr. Tulu Sham's Family Telehealth Project, um, and that's a link to the website if you'd like to look a little more at it. Um, with a, a collaborator from UCLA and, and a couple of individuals at UCSF, what we're doing is uh, we're working with fa Spanish speaking families in the child protective services um, to culturally adapt the family telehealth project. So it's a manualized intervention and it's short term uh, that focuses on affect regulation. Uh, some of the uh, a few a few more models that we're using is trauma fo focused cognitive behavioral therapy and child parent psychotherapy, amongst other models as well. Um, and getting close to the end. Yeah, so lastly, um, um, in terms of research, in terms of making a lasting impact, um, I think one of the biggest things, so from our positive adaptations model, we've had something like 90% attendance over 10 weeks with the families that we've been engaging in. And I think one of the biggest reasons is me being in clinic, um, being connected to the uh, hospital staff, as well as the families that come into clinic, um, it, it helps to engage some of the families. Um, something else that's pretty important is meeting the basic needs. So we know that meeting needs like housing support, legal support, financial support, transportation, all the wonderful things that our case managers help us out with. Um, if once we're able to meet those basic needs, then we're able to engage the family in a deeper level mental health therapy. Um, and if you have any questions or yeah, further for uh, potential collaborations, uh, there's my email address and my work cell. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I'd like to invite uh, Santoy to come back on and then, uh, and also uh, again, introduce uh, Gina, Dr. Gina Lewis, who is uh, the medical director of the Federal Qualified Health Center at uh, Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland to get us started with a couple of her own questions. And then we'll also invite each of you um, to please put questions in the chat and um, or in the um, or in the Q and A, and we'll try to monitor and we'll get to as many questions as we can with our remaining twenty minutes. Thank you so much. I I just want to say I was really moved by your both of your presentations. Um, um, just hearing, especially I think, hearing the stories of some of the individual kids. Just thinking about what what um, what kids are up against right now. It's really overwhelming. Um, Gina, you want to start? I think you're on, you're, you're on mute. Sure. Everyone can unmute just so that we can all hear each other and make sure we aren't having to toggle up and back. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Santoy and David. Really beautiful presentations and heartfelt. And um, I know the incredible work you do, and I feel lucky to be your colleague. Uh, and I am appreciative to be able to ask some of the first questions. And um, I... I'm, you know, a clinician myself, and I've seen a lot of um, things over the years, um, challenging situations with, with children and youth and families. Um, this, this pandemic has greatly magnified it, like we were talking about earlier before we started the webinar. And I, um, I do see a lot of 
research potential to come out of this. I think some of the work that you're already doing and have already done, um, we could all learn a lot from um, just in, in how, we're, how we're interacting and communicating with families and just holding, holding what we've all been through and are going through. I have a couple specific questions and one of them is around refugee and unaccompanied minors. Um, and I know that there are a lot of validated tools for assessing anxiety in particular with COVID, uh, anxiety and depression with, with youth um, around kind of COVID and fears. Are there anything in, in your knowledge specifically, um, David, for, for children who are refugees or are unaccompanied minors? Any uh, validated tools? Any validated tools? Um, is is uh, there anything in, 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 in some of the work that you were doing with, the, for instance, the, the positive adaptations for trauma that you talked about or the, the culturally adapted telehealth model? Sure. Is there any part of that that's an a, a evalu evaluation? Sure. Um, for, the, for the model that I talked about, um, we look at um, trauma experiences um, with the UCLA PTSD index. So there's a trauma reaction index that looks at 20, 29 different trauma experiences, the age of the trauma experience, um, whether they witnessed or, or they, were, they actually endured the trauma. Um, and then once they evaluate the trauma experiences, they also go into trauma symptomatology. Um, and people have actually turned that UCLA PTSD index into a COVID screener as well. Um, sometimes for more basic mental health screener, um, so, uh, we've used the ACORN. Um, and then in terms of like individuals that have been through multiple traumatic experiences, we'll use the, the trauma symptom checklist. Um, we'll also use the child depression inventory. Um, but yeah, it just depends upon what we want to assess. So I, I look a lot at trauma, and so I use a lot of the trauma instruments. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. And the one of my other questions relates to what I've seen personally as a clinician around increase in drug use and increase in vaping marijuana, um, which I you know think is is much more concentrated version than you know the marijuana of the sixties, seventies, eighties. And I think that the what I've seen, unfortunately, is a is a lot of youth who've um, Who'd have, who've had paranoid breaks and have ended up in hospitalized for that. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any um, experience with um, uh, both your, your uh, personal experience wa watching youth and whether this is indeed the truth about the increase in use of um, uh, vaping marijuana and its relation to paranoia. Uh, but also, um, what are the, what, what's out there? I, I have been, it's been really hard to find programs that will address the needs of kids who, youth who are, who are experiencing this, who, who want to get off of the marijuana. I've had several uh, emerging adults who've come in and said, I need to, I'm addicted to marijuana. I need to get off. Are there rehab programs for me? And I, I've had difficulty finding those programs. I will, um, I'll take kind of first, there's definitely a gap in substance abuse services for adolescents. Um, I do wanna hold the, also Gina that um, generally when there is a first psychotic break, it would, I think it's usually between the ages of 16 and 20, for, right, so hold it, that that's when we're gonna see it, right? And for some young people, there's more vulnerability to that. Um, that we do see, of course, young people and their families are coping through substance use. Um, and part of it is like, how do we, um, as a clinician, right, go um, kind of affirm, validate, yes, that's a coping strategy. Yes, there's a lot of stressors that you're managing with and continue to build out their menu of different coping strategies and things that they can do. I think sometimes that side-by-side -side work where we're not looking, you know, we're doing more harm reduction um, work um, is, is really important and meeting a young person where they're at. Um, and I think the continuing to link their 
are some continue to link to the substance abuse providers that they are, but I think that there's not, um, I can share in just a moment, like some of the specific ones, but there's, we also find that challenge inside of the schools. Like who can we refer to? Um, there's supposed to be substance abuse services here. They're not, right? There's not a provider, even if there's a contract for one. Um, and so really integrating that into our mental health work or how does a physician integrate that into their primary care work, um, really continue to build the coping strategies and also um, education. Um, I do want to lift up Monifa Willis, um, nurse practitioner who holds a lot of expertise in this area. And um, so just want to at least put her name out here uh, as well. Thank you. She's Thank wonderful. You. I um, let, let me um, dig into a couple of the questions that have come up um, in the chat, although we have we have room for more. People have additional questions they want to add, but I think one of the, you brought up some cases, uh, some severe cases of uh, real challenges that are kind of going to show up in the, in, the, in the office, in the school, in the office, and people are going to, of course, do their best to address those issues. Um, but I, we, based on Santoy's talk, it's, it's, um, it's not just that we're seeing more severe cases that are going to show themselves in the in the clinic or in the school, but there are a large a very, there seems to be a very large number of children and families that are having troubles coping that are not coming to anyone's attention at this point. And I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are about how to understand those larger population-based issues and how um, what kinds of interventions are available to um, for, for schools and clinics and uh, academic health centers to work together uh, to address some of these issues perhaps, or even to study them. And i um, very curious to hear sort of how we can address these things as a community. That could be to either one of you. And don't answer right away. <laughs> But. I mean, I think part of it is that we all have mental health, right? And, you know, how do we start talking about that, embed it in our school cur curriculum, right? Mental health, emotional health and well-being. How do you cultivate it? How do you protect it? How do you take care of it? Um, you know, I think that's why I, I am glad that there's more kind of conversation. I mean, the young people... Instagram, TikTok, they're talking about it. They're self-diagnosing themselves. I have a young person. I have high functioning depression. Um, you know, I have that they are talking about it and diagnosing themselves. And so how do we actually get then the intervention, the treatment, the coping skills, the strategies, um, the ways to access emotional regulation, um, distress tolerance. Like I, I do draw a lot on the dialectical behavioral skills um, for adolescents because it impacts it affects both like trauma and regulation, which, and for adolescents, the behaviors can be at such a high level of risk. But those skills don't, those skills can be taught in a classroom. Um, you know, those skills might be able to be taught in the waiting room of a clinic. Um, you know, like what's the skill of a month? Um, but like we need to popularize um, interventions, education, and skill building around mental health. Um, and I think that the, the teen collective dialogue, and please forgive me any teens that are watching, because I'm not a teen, but what I hear from teens, they are aware of the diagnosis, the symptoms, and um, they're, they, they are, they're trying, they're putting those on, right? I have borderline, you know, I have borderline, I'm bipolar, right? You hear them saying that, but what if we had them like, I actually know some interventions. Like this, these are things I can do. These are skills. These are ways that I can regulate my emotions more than just actually self-labeling and self-diagnosing. Um, how do we get that into Instagram, TikTok, schools, classrooms, and really get that you know more in our collective environment? And it takes the adults also talking about our mental health and well-being, right? It takes us talking about our anxiety, our depression, our suicidal ideation, our suicide survival. Right, like if we are also talking about those things, um, then we, um, we we create kind of more of a dialogue. David, do you have anything to add? Sure. Help me understand the question again. I think it was the thinking about interventions that can be more broadly applicable, as opposed to I, I, we obviously need to focus on the, the individual cases, like the ones you presented, where there's 
severe and immediate issues that come to our attention that we know we need to address as hard as it is, but there's also a larger population of uh, children and families that are maybe experiencing what seems to all of us to be lower level issues that don't come to our attention, but actually they're very important to try to address. And how do we, how do we start to do that as a community or as a, or how do we connect the dots with right. all of the different types of services that are looking at different sides of the problem to work on these things collaboratively? Mm -hmm. um, I, a few things come up, but the, the most obvious one for myself is being inside of an integrated healthcare facility. So um, the way that our program is set up is that every time a family comes to see a physician, they're also seeing a mental health provider. Um, so that's one way to be able to do a, a quick and rapid assessment, but also the, the continued collaboration. So uh, having meetings about uh, what's coming up amongst the providers and then um, multiple ways that we can intervene together. Great. Okay. I have uh, Roberto Vargas uh, shared something in the a question in the chat I'd like to read to you. Um, first, he says, thank you so much for the important work of serving our children, especially those most oppressed by our foreign and domestic policy structures. Please share any thoughts you have um, about how we can best support the needs of youth in low communities, I guess, particularly in the East Bay, or how we can support the needs of minors separated from their families by our government. I understand that Title 42, even under Biden, may have separated more than 20,000 children from their families without adequate tracking of where children and their parents end up. The Caravan for Children is educating us about this tragedy locally and advocating nationally for the needs of these families. So I guess it's just a question about, um, you know, uh, what we can do to support the needs of, of, of these these children and their families. Um, there's some interesting research out there that's starting to look at the mental health needs of these kids that have gone through um, a family separation. So there's older research, but there's newer research as well that started to happen when um, the separation at the border was happening. Um, um, and then my own research. So what I was finding with kids that have been separated from their parents related to deportation is that they were experiencing more PTSD and more anger. Um, when, I when I went to look at the treatment interventions related to a caregiver deportation, there was a, a lot less um, literature on what people are actually doing to impact the mental health needs. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful area to to begin to build more treatment interventions, but then that's also something that I've been doing at Children's Hospital and the, the PATH model that I talked about is that um, we've targeted kids that have been through a family separation um, and taken them through this model. Let me, um, let me ask, is it okay if I ask another question? Yes, please do. I wanna, I wanna address a couple of the things that I've seen in the chat and also the Q&A around kind of this dichotomy of we need less social media and more engagement in the world. We may need to help parents and family to feel less scared about letting their children and youth kind of be, be free. And, um, you know, we have telehealth now and there's this whole idea about virtual group support. Christine Carey put that in the Q&A um, that can be helpful. Um, so I wondered if you might address kind of that dichotomy that we're all living with. I think holding, you know, social media is a tool. Um, someone was sharing the other day a uh, story about, remember we used to go to the internet, right? We didn't have it with us all the time. Like you would go to a computer, go to the internet, and then you'd go about your day. Um, and, you know, I think social media right now is, a, you know, it's also a little bit like smoking. You know, I feel like, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to have studies on the impact of kind of internet kind of always being with us and some of the, and we already have some of those studies, right? How it impacts anxiety, mood. Um, and, you know, for us to, and it's also in terms of having technology, telehealth, I love that many times young people had their therapists in their pocket so they could be wherever they were and they had a therapy session and they picked up their phone and they logged into their DBT in Espanol or their DBT group for black youth, right? Like no matter what, like I'm getting my hair done and I'm in therapy, right? So it did make it much more accessible. And so of course, like, 
you know, as adults, as parents, we have to keep the guardrails up, right? We have those guardrails, we give them, you know, support healthy limits, you know, as much as possible and education around that, you know, to parents, um, to caregivers, to students themselves, um, young people themselves. And we also create healthy al alternatives for connection, right? Because oftentimes what, that's what young people are seeking is connection. And so do we have healthy activities and ways for them to engage? Um, I wanted to also speak a little bit to um, the question that Roberto posed too is, you know, in speaking about those opportunities for connection, you know, in our clinics, we did have also trauma and acculturation groups um, and really saw how those groups built the resiliency and the connection. And we had thought initially, like, would recent immigrant youth, particularly those from Central America, uh, be in a group because they're, they're um, would they be feel safe to share their stories? Um, given the level of trauma stories, but also given the, you know, potential real threat in terms of gang uh, cartels and gang involvement. Um, and what we found that young people did engage in group, right? And they did, um, particularly having cultural practices and really reframing it, like reframing some of the interventions, uh, really grounding them in cultural practices, uh, really supported young people to decrease their uh, trauma responses um, and to build their, their resiliency. And I think the other piece is we need to learn how to bring, particularly for, I'm going to speak more to adolescents and not child, but mental health services. We're kind of just, we are coming towards the end of our hour, so I just yeah. want to yeah, that, but but just please, please finish your answer. Yeah, just to adolescents and families in a way that they can get it. So like not you're going to therapy every week, but those light touches, being able to access services through text or quick phone calls, right? Kind of that pre-therapy therapy, like how do we begin to be able to provide that and bill for that, um, you know, for young people and parents, caregivers that are multi-stressed um, rather than your appointment is every Thursday at three o'clock that might not be the best way. So those are just some ideas. I just wanna thank the speakers for, um, thank you both and thank you Gina also for um, joining us as a moderator for your, your wonderful presentations and for helping us to understand the challenges and maybe get some ideas about where we might start looking for some of the solutions. Um, we didn't get to all the questions, there was a question and I think was also very interesting um, to think about it as, um, you know, we spoke a lot about the Latinx and African-American and um, poor communities, but it's not just limited to those populations that these issues are spread across to other, other groups. And um, there's a lot of questions about how to, how to, um, how are we going to address those issues? I think this, um, what, what we would hope is that this presentation and conversation can stimulate some uh, connections that can facilitate um, community-wide um, approaches to address these issues, um, perhaps uh, that could be formally evaluated and then um, implemented widely, um, because we always hear about uh, interventions that are working well in a, in a small study or a research setting, but it doesn't get widely generalized. How can we implement the solutions that um, David and Santoy um, are proposing widely and really understand how, how um, kids and families can, can benefit? Um, I'm gonna ask you each to, if you have any final words and then we'll, we'll uh, conclude the webinar. Um, we'll start with you, David. And I just uh, appreciated being able to to talk about what we've been seeing and people to be interested in what's going on with the communities that we're working with. And uh, I appreciate this collaborative. And uh, yeah, uh, if there's any further questions or comments, uh, please reach out. Just again, appreciate everyone here for all of your commitment to children, to youth, to families, and just encourage us all to keep um, maybe just stretch a little beyond our comfort zone and talk about mental health, emotional health, and well-being um, with our colleagues, with each other, um, so that we can have more, that be more of a common conversation. Thank you so much. Right, and Gina? So I, I'm, I have a lot of ideas from all of you, and it's exciting to step outside of what I usually do to hear, hear it from your perspective. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. And uh, once again, I hope that um, we can continue some of these conversations at our September 23rd 
uh, meeting at uh, Mission Bay. All of you who registered for the webinar will receive a, uh, an invitation and COVID-19 and its aftermath will be uh, one of the topics of discussion. So we can continue the conversation there and I'm hoping that as many of you as possible will consider coming. Thank you very much. And I think with that, we'll sign off and thank you all um, for attending and for everyone for their engagement and interesting questions for the panelists.